gathering data on foreign investment. Does British Columbia have good data on where foreign money is coming from? We have decent data, uh, but not nearly as good as we should. Um, it's only started to be collected in the last few months, um, so we have an initial picture of it, um, but we need much better data. Uh, the data shows that there was significant amount of buying um, of residential property in Vancouver in uh, the past couple of months. It was around 15% uh, as a share of value prior to the introduction of our tax. Um, and then subsequently it's fallen quite dramatically. When you did your paper, when you did your study, was there good data to go on or not? No, uh, not of the government provided sort. The government has been very wary of providing data for a long time, um, partly because they didn't want action on it, I think. Um, but you could piece together the case for why foreign money was having a big impact through a variety of other sources. And we did have good data on some aspects of that stuff uh, in terms of immigration patterns of wealthy uh, migrants. We had good data on that. Uh, we had data from certain researchers at SFU on who was buying the top end markets. Um, we had surveys of realtors. Um, a, a fellow named Andy Yan had a very important study that showed that about 70% of the high-end homes in a, in a part of the city were being sold to people with ethnic Chinese last names, and which was a far greater proportion than their, than their share of the population. And that suggested that there was a lot of money that was entering the market. Let's talk about Chinese money. What, did, what do we need to know about Chinese money? Um, in terms of its availability for buying property, not just in Vancouver, but maybe in London and Auckland. What do we need to know about that? I mean, this is a global phenomenon, what we're seeing. Um, there's been about a trillion dollars that left China in the last year or so, which is a, which is a ton of money. Um, and a lot of that was invested in real estate. That's one of the classic holdings of Chinese investors is in real estate. Um, and so we've seen a surge of buying of from China, both in Australia and the US. They have good data on this, and there was a clear surge in 2014, 2015. Um, and we know, or we can infer, that that's happened in Vancouver too, and that's likely happened in Auckland. And what's that done to property prices in Vancouver? It's made property prices surge. Uh, property prices uh, grew about 30% in the past year and a bit. Um, and nothing really fundamentally changed at the local level to explain that. Uh, that's likely the role of foreign money. So when you did your study, you came up with some solutions about maybe stopping this. Yes. Uh, what did you offer and what's been accepted? Yeah. So one of the policy options that I, that I looked at was the, the type of tax that has been introduced, which is a 15% uh, surtax on kind of the buying of property on the immediate sale. Um, but more fundamentally, if you want to address the disconnection of the housing market from the local labor market, which is the fundamental problem here. Uh, what you need to do is you, you can raise uh, property taxes, you can impose a surtax on, on property taxes, but that you can make that amount that's paid offsetable against what you pay in income taxes. And what that means is that mostly people who are local, who, who earn their money locally, will be essentially free of the tax. They'll, they'll be exempt from the tax. Uh, you exempt seniors who aren't going to be making a lot of money. And what that does is that then makes sure that the demand for housing is local rather than from overseas. Okay. What do you call that kind of tax? Uh, it would be called a progressive property surtax um, deductible against income tax paid. There's a couple of different professors who have proposed this. Uh, Kesselman is a, a colleague of mine and uh, there's a Souter proposal from the business school uh, up at UBC. Okay. So the government took up your proposal of a 15% surtax. What's been the effect of that on the property market? Uh, I mean, in a longer term sense, it's, it's too early to tell. It's only been about a month and a half or, or almost two months now. Um, but what has happened is that there's been a, a quite sharp slowdown in the amount of sales. Um, prices seem to have declined. Average sales prices have declined uh, quite dramatically, but that's not clear whether that's a compositional effect. So they've declined about 16% in a month, which is substantial. Um, and what's really happened is that the foreign money from the most recent data has dried up. Essentially, it was 15% before thereabouts, uh, and now it's under 1% of buying is coming from foreign sources of, of that kind of pure foreign buyer uh, sort. And so that's a substantial impact. You see, in my country, it's not cool to talk about Chinese money. 
because it sounds maybe there's a racial aspect to this. Was that the case here in Vancouver or has that changed? What's happened? There was a taboo, but at a certain point it became kind of blindingly obvious that this was playing a major role and, and it was creating a housing affordability crisis and a rental crisis. And as a result, uh, if you're trying to deal with a policy problem, you really need to look at it frankly and, and look at the evidence. And so at a certain point, uh, people started to say, look, this is not about the, the ethnicity or the, the nationality of the money. This is about simply uh, the money being disconnected or, or detached from the local labor market. And that's making it unaffordable for locals to purchase housing. Let's just talk about that for a moment, because um, this big Chinese money, the slush fund of Chinese money that's coming out, um, is the money's being made in China, isn't it? And, the, and in other places. The, is the, 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 it's not doing anything for the local economy. Uh, Chinese people are buying property in areas where they're not actually making any difference to the economy. Is that that's correct? Right. Do I understand correctly? Yeah, that's largely correct. I mean, there's been a couple of different concerns. I mean, one thing is there, for a long time, from the real estate industry, was suggestions that all this foreign money was going to be help, uh, helping to grow our economy and, and things of that sort. But incomes in Vancouver are actually amongst the lowest in urban Canada. Uh, so it hasn't really provided us with much of a benefit in that sense. And yet we've got sky-high housing prices. Um, what happened was that there were a lot of people that arrived over and brought money that bought houses, but they weren't engaging in economic activity here. And so the, the amount of taxes that they pay for you know, schools, education, and so on is very low, and yet the, the value of their houses is extremely high. Well, I'm wondering whether in New Zealand we're just too polite to talk about this issue. Is, is politeness a problem? Yeah, I mean, for a long time, you would kind of be shunned a little bit if you started to talk about the nature of this dynamic, uh, where it was coming from, that it was from China. Um, that was perceived to be kind of xenophobic or racist. And again, as I, as I said, it, it's kind of gone by the wayside now because we now have the data which shows this. Um, and it's just basically been widely accepted that that's the dynamic that's going on and we have a crisis. And so you simply need to be frank about these things. Let's talk about the disconnect. Sure. between what people can earn and what they have to pay for houses. We, this is a major problem for us in New Zealand. You've thought about some solutions, haven't you? Yes. Uh, other than the 15% surtax, what yes. kind of solutions have you thought about? The, the main one that I think I would recommend is a progressive property surtax that is uh, offset by the income tax that you pay. Um, and you usually have a threshold upon which, over which the, the tax applies and you get the money back to the extent that you're earning money locally. Uh, and so as a result, the demand for housing uh, comes to be focused much more from local sources and not from foreign sources because those foreign sources will be taxed on a yearly basis at quite stiff rates, potentially. So you do this for everybody? You do this for everyone. This, this applies to everyone. So this will apply to people who, uh, such as criminals who are tax evading. Um, so this applies to everyone regardless of nationality, ethnicity, etc. This is uh, simply to make sure that everybody, if they're owning property, pays their fair share of taxes. How good are Canadian uh, officials at gathering taxes? Because we're not terribly good. We've got about maybe 1 billion to 5 billion estimated yeah. of tax evasion each year that we're not collecting. Right. Th that's the beauty of the proposal is that it's very hard to evade. Essentially it's added on to your property taxes, and property taxes are fairly easy to collect. Um, so this is actually a very difficult tax to evade, and it saves you money in terms of chasing after people for the standard forms of tax evasion, just by essentially making it impossible to evade that property tax. What happens to people now about getting housing who haven't got good incomes? Who, how do they get housed? Uh, well, I mean, you have to rent, uh, but you also have the phenomenon of a lot of people going into a lot of debt. Uh, essentially, that's what's happened. Uh, Vancouver is probably the most indebted city by a considerable, bar considerable margin in Canada, um, just because people have stretched themselves to the limit financially in order to buy a house. You see, that's the problem, isn't it? If you've stretched yourself and then there's an economic downturn or Absolutely. there's some blip in the, uh, in the economy, those people are going to get caught, aren't they? Sure. Yeah, or a rise in interest rates. And any of those types of phenomenon will cause a crash and all the people who have bought in near the peak will be hurt uh, substantially and you know, will have to either declare bankruptcy or be having to pay a lot of their incomes towards this house that's now worth far less than what they paid for. Let's talk about interest rates for a moment, Josh, because we've got very low interest rates in New Zealand. Um, 
uh, what is the relationship? What is your what are your interest rates and your loan to value ratios? I mean, are you looking at putting those up, or what's going to happen to those? There has been a bit of regulation of mortgage rules. Um, our, our interest rates are also very low, and mortgage rates are also very low. That's that's pretty much a global phenomenon right now. Um, but those haven't had a huge impact, and and the federal government is wary of doing something about that because that would affect markets outside of Vancouver and Toronto, which are the main ones that have been affected by foreign capital and which have affordability problems. And they don't want to cause housing problems in other cities that don't have these same kinds of affordability challenges. We've got what's called a knock-on problem. Yes. Rich Aucklanders are cashing up and going to other places and that's lifting prices um, in other satellite cities. What's happening in Vancouver in terms of people maybe leaving the town? One of the things that's happening is that people are cashing out from their equity gains in their houses and uh, purchasing houses in other parts of the province. And so you see rising house prices across the province in smaller cities, and that's causing issues elsewhere too. So rising prices migrate? Yeah, rising prices definitely migrate uh, to different uh, locales. Yes. What other solutions uh, have you thought about? Yeah, um, I mean, I've thought mostly about the, the foreign money aspect of things. Um, at times, you need to uh, make sure that the people who are building houses are, are, are building family-friendly units and not building uh, aimed at foreign investors. I think that that's an important component of this. And so you mandate that in new construction, a certain proportion is family-friendly. And I think that that's an important step. Uh, at times, sometimes you might want to relax some of the, the regulations in the, in the midst of a crisis to make building a little bit easier. But I would be quite cautious about that because usually you don't want to kind of uh, exaggerate the amount of supply that comes online in a housing boom uh, where it's all driven by credit um, and, and foreign money. Uh, because then if that credit and that foreign money dries up, then all of a sudden you'll have a bunch of excess supply and that can cause a crash. I've only been in Vancouver for a day and so I've driven through the suburbs and I see um, Houses pretty similar to New Zealand, similar construction, uh, people with a little garden and a, a yard out the back. Um, has Vancouver thought about how its city is going to look in the future? Can we continue to have single building accommodation? In Vancouver you have a distinct problem because we're hemmed in by the mountains and the water and so the, the amount of land that you can expand into is, is limited and so yes, gradually we're going to need to change our patterns of, of living mm. and, and that will need to happen. But mm. uh, you know, this is an exaggerated reaction uh, in terms of prices to mm. that phenomenon that we're seeing right now. Talk to me about the supply issue. Mm. There's an argument that goes, all you've got to do is to increase the supply and it will all come right. What do you think about that? Uh, that doesn't seem to work. Uh, we've been building a ton in uh, Vancouver. Uh, for several years now, we're actually at near record levels of production currently, and yet you still have prices that are sky high. Uh, that hasn't seemed to kind of dampen uh, the price pressures, uh, so I don't think that that's a solution in and of itself. So who's buying those houses? Because if local people aren't earning enough to buy them, does this mean that foreign buyers are buying these new yes. houses? So you have foreign buyers and you also have uh, local investors who are buying up properties. I mean, in the midst of a bubble, there's a lot of speculative activity. And that comes from local sources, but it also comes from kind of quote unquote local sources because a lot of the people who are Canadian citizens or residents are getting their money from overseas to do this kind of activity. And so you have a lot of speculative activity that's going on and that's helping to drive up the prices as well. If you were hired as a consultant to the New Zealand government to tell them what they should be doing in big cities like Auckland, what would you tell them? What would you advise them? I think a, a good first start is in fact the kind of tax that we've imposed. Um, it does two things. First of all, there's a lot of money coming in from overseas, and we now know this uh, from our data collection. Uh, and so that will kind of limit the amount of competition for housing that's going on currently in the crisis. But what it also does is it shifts expectations. And a lot of people have this expectation that prices are always going to go up. And so they do somewhat foolish things financially in that mindset. Uh, and so you really want to address that first and foremost. So that's the first step I would take. Then I would start to address kind of ho affordable housing initiatives, uh, potentially building some rental, purpose-built rental, uh, things of that sort. And then lastly, I would definitely introduce some kind of a property surtax that could be deducted against income tax paid.